You have called to us the life of faith. You have called to us the life of faith. Oh Lord, our gracious God, we thank you that as the people of Denmark came to this country in large numbers, that you made sure that the faith came with them, that you inspired many of them by your Holy Spirit to long for your word and for your sacrament and to seek ways to build a church in this country so that those divine gifts might continue to be given. We pray, Lord, that we might learn from their faith and their commitment their courage and their persistence, so that as we look toward the next 150 years, we may be confident of your presence with us and strive to do your will as you work through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last session uh, we noted uh, and focused some on the weaknesses of the church in Denmark in the 19th century which is the context out of which all of these immigrants came to this country. Uh, a lot of the upper crust Danes were uh, captivated by, by the rationality, uh, human reason as triumphant, that denied the reality of God. Common people were more swayed by Marxist thinking, that um, all of the uh, upper class people were out to get them, and that religion was just the opiate that kept them down, the opiate of the masses. In addition to that, the church itself was state funded. And uh, so there was little connection between pastors and people, little sense of parish life. Church became very formalistic and uh, all about uh, ritual. And as a result of that, many Danes who came to this country simply ditched religion entirely. I mean, not just a, a Danish Lutheran church, but any church, any kind of religious faith. But then we also saw how God worked to renew the church in Denmark, and then how that came across uh, the pond with the immigrants as well. Uh, two of the key leaders uh, were NFS, Nikolai Frederick Severin Grunfi, um, great hymn writer, a, a cultural teacher, uh, just a, a kind of a Renaissance man who was enormously influential in 19th century Denmark. And then Wilhelm Beck, uh, which is not so much about him personally, but he was a key a leader of the intermission movement, this pietistic renewal that really tried to stir people back up in terms of their uh, commitment to Christ and the faith. Well, those two efforts uh, Grunfi and the intermission movement directly influenced uh, the Danish Christians who came to America. Now actually the very first uh, Danes uh, came here really early. Um, the first Lutherans came in 1619 and 1620, same time as the Pilgrims. Um, pastor Rasmus Jensen uh, was the first Lutheran pastor ever to come to the Western Hemisphere. He uh, was a, a chaplain who accompanied Captain Jens Munk, M-U-N-K. We say Munk, but it's Munk. Um, he was one of those trying to find the fabled Northwest Passage uh, through Canada to get to India more quickly uh, before they understood that there's a whole lot of Canada there you can't get through. So he made it as far as a camp on the Churchill River. And this is a drawing that uh, someone in his group made of their little camp on the Churchill River in Canada. Uh, they wintered there, but uh, of the 65 men he brought with him, counting Monk himself, 62 died that winter. Um, from uh, disease and cold and just all sorts of miserable things, including Rasmus Jensen. Um, uh, shortly after the New Year, into 1620, he became very ill. Uh, the record says that on January 23rd, he actually sat up in his sick bed and preached one last sermon <laughs> to the few remaining uh, men in the camp. But then on February 20th, he died. 
Jens Munk and the two other surviving sailors miraculously managed to return to Denmark, just the three of them. And that's how we know this story. Otherwise, it might have been lost to history entirely. And actually, uh, the, our green hymnal, if you look way in the front, there's a calendar of commemorations and festivals. And February 20th is a commemoration day for Rasmus Jensen um, as the first Lutheran pastor in North America. Also, I don't know if you've seen this line around. This is a, a little magazine put out by Institute of Lutheran Theology. And the new word at work that just came out has a, a short, interesting article about Rasmus Jensen, uh, written by uh, Tom Jacobson, a wonderful a young historian in the church. Well, not long after this, a small Danish community also gathered in what is now New York. It was still called New Amsterdam at the time, settled by the Dutch. But one of the people who lived there was actually a Dane. His name was Jochem Peterson Keiter. Now you notice the Dutch spelling, even of Peterson. <laughs> so he's a Dane, but he's heavily influenced by uh, Dutch, Dutch culture and language. He was the first white man to settle by the Harlem River. Um, and of course, New Amsterdam is just a little tiny thing at the very tip of Manhattan at that point. So he's up a little bit out into the wilderness. Uh, now it's all one big city. But uh, he was the first white person to uh, settle there. This picture was discovered in 1952 um, behind a wall of a house, and it's thought to be perhaps the first painting ever done in this country. And it pictures, if you can see this boat with about five, six guys in it, and they're heading to this ship that's called the Princess. Well, one of the guys in the boat is Joachim Keiter, and he's under arrest because he spoke out against the corruption of the governor of New Amsterdam, who then you know, trumped up charges against him and is taking him back to Holland for trial. Um, well, on the way, there was a shipwreck. Um, before the ship went down, the, the, the governor admitted he was wrong, asked Keiter's forgiveness. Keiter survived, was eventually acquitted of the charges in Holland, and then came back to the New World, to New Amsterdam. And there he and his brother-in-law, a man named Jonas Bronk, uh, uh, were leaders of this little community of Danes up in northern Manhattan. And they started a, a congregation there. I don't know that they had a pastor, but they, they, had, they were at least gathering for devotional work there. This is a, no doubt a fanciful picture drawn much later, but that's supposed to be Jonas Bronk there uh, leaning over the table uh, at the center of the picture. He and Keiter um, did try to defend the American Indians in the area. Uh, and ironically, just a few days after having spoken out very boldly, Keiter was murdered by the Indians. <laughs> but Bronk hung around for a little longer, and that is why one of the five boroughs of New York is called the Bronx. Oh. It's named for a Dane, Jonas Bronk, and so it turned into the Bronx. Now, these early uh, Danish groups were few and far between. <laughs> I mean, these are just sort of curiosity stories from way, way back when. Danish immigrants didn't start coming in larger numbers until the mid to late 19th century, in the 1800s, is when you start to see them. From 1820 to 1960, so 140 years. I think we sometimes think that immigration ended in the early 20th century. It didn't. It, it, the numbers dropped dramatically. There was actually a law passed that almost shut down immigration. But there were still a trickle of immigrants that were allowed in. Um, so all the way up to 1960, a total of almost 346,000 Danish immigrants came to this country. Now, that's a pretty good number, but it's much smaller than the Norwegians or the Swedes or the Germans or some of the other groups. Um, of those 346,000, 
best guess is some 75% rejected any religion at all. So what was their reason for coming? For the Danes, it was not to escape persecution. Um, they were coming as explorers, as settlers in the New World. And so uh, what Christianity they brought with them actually came from the Church of Denmark. So Rasmus Jensen was a Church of Denmark pastor who just came along with them. The pilgrims were trying to escape uh, religious persecution, but the Danes were not. Um, there really was only the Church of Denmark. You, you didn't have the, the separatist movement that you had in, in Britain. So. Well, of the other 25%, around uh, 23,000 of those, a little more, are known to have become Mormons. Uh, a bunch of them settled in Utah and really fell under the sway of Mormonism. So that left roughly, out of this entire group, 60 to 65,000 Danes who maintained their Christian faith in this country. That obviously doesn't count people who are born here, you know, future generations, but of those who immigrated, roughly 60 to 65,000. Now they, of course, didn't all end up in Danish Lutheran churches. They joined other American churches, other Scandinavian churches. So, when we trace our heritage back as a Danish Lutheran church in this country, we're really talking the remnant. I mean, there weren't that many who ended up keeping this tradition in this country. Uh, it makes the fact of this church's founding all the more kind of miraculous, um, a reason for gratitude. But even with subsequent births, um, the Danish Lutheran churches, before they merged into other denominations and kind of uh, disappeared, uh, topped out at about 94,000 members. Uh, so the, the two main denominations that we'll talk about here in a little bit, grand total, were still under 100,000 members. Now, the first uh, Danish Lutheran church in the United States was uh, in Racine, Wisconsin. Racine was a center of Danish life in this country uh, for many, many, many years. Uh, it was organized in 1851, but at that time, I bet, um, it was a joint effort with uh, Norwegian Lutherans. It, you could hardly justify separating yourselves, there just weren't enough people. So it was a joint Norwegian-Danish uh, congregation, and actually in 1851 the Norwegians were in the majority. But for some reason, uh, by about within 20 years, the Danes were in the majority and the Norwegians had gone elsewhere. So this ends up being considered the first Danish congregation in the country. They built a church in 1852. Um, this picture is from much later. It's from 1894 and you notice it's been turned into a blacksmith shop. <laughs> um, whether there was any more decoration to it originally, if the blacksmith took anything off it, but it's a pretty plain box, you know. It's just a very uh, simple building there. But I also found it interesting, Paul Nyholm tells this a story that uh, Emmaus in, in their own history found a set of directions for painting the interior of the church in 1868. And this is what it said, ceiling sky blue, walls light blue, as light as possible, doors and windows white, altar and pulpit white trimmed with gold, wainscoting, that's, you know, uh, on the wall up to about that level, tr uh, light violet, upper edge of the gallery, black walnut color, steps to pulpit in front of the altar ring, light violet. Sounds positively garish to me. I mean, talk about a riot of colors. You sort of got the whole rainbow on there, you know? Roy G. Biv is uh, so just interesting that for as plain a little building as they had, they wanted it bright and colorful inside. Um, now, the first um, entirely Danish church right from the get-go was uh, probably First Trinity in Indianapolis. Um, that was founded in 1868. So, you know, 17 years after Emmaus, but there was enough of a Danish community there that they could form their own Danish church. Uh, 
Now, oddly, you can see the dates here, especially um, the 1868 date. This book I've been using by Paul C. Nyholm um, is aware of uh, Faith Lutheran, Main Street Lutheran, because it's listed in some of the tables, and he quotes from some of our pastors, N.B. Hansen, a couple of times. But he does not list... Uh, this congregation as among the first Danish churches in America. He has a list of about six or eight that are the earliest ones that go past 1870, but we're not on the list. And I'm not sure what to make of that. And I don't really have the resources to, to track it down. That, that would be quite a project. Um, was it because the, the start date here wasn't recognized widely? Uh, we know they didn't even have a pastor for about 14 years. It was just when someone would, you know, circuit in. But for whatever reason, even though Faith Lutheran was a, was a major congregation within this group of, of Danish Lutherans, we're not listed as one of the earliest ones, and we ought to be, actually, by founding date. Well, eventually, the Danes ended up with two Lutheran denominations in America. But there were several other church bodies earlier uh, that led up to those two. The earliest was the Norwegian Danish Augustana Synod. Augustana is the Latin form of Augsburg, so the Augsburg Confession, uh, that key Lutheran confession. So the name Augustana shows up, or Augsburg. Um, they both show up quite a bit. Formed in 1860. This, uh, and, and these are very small groups. <laughs> I mean, don't be thinking nationwide denominations here. Um, this uh, Augustan, Norwegian Danish Augustan actually had no Danish pastors. Pastors were all of Norwegian background. But they did serve some Danish congregations. And that's how Danish gets into the name of that synod. Ten years later, though, it's split into three groups. And this is largely a function of many, many, many more immigrants coming to the country. So you can afford to be a little more selective. <laughs> and people really uh, cotton together in their ethnic groups. So the Swedes kept the Augustana name. And in fact, uh, the Augustana Synod continued right up until 1962 as the main Swedish church in the United States. Some of the Norwegians went to uh, what they called Norwegian Augustana. It would be nice if they had branched out a little bit on the names. <laughs> but it's the same name words over and over again, just uh, mixed up in different pairings uh, in these uh, different little churches. But the third group, and the one that we want to pay more attention to, was called the Conference for the Norwegian Danish Lutheran Church in America, formed in 1870. That name doesn't really roll off the tongue. So much more often, it's referred to as the Norwegian Danish Conference. Uh, and this is how you'll see it if you ever do try to read any of this church history. The Norwegian Danish Conference is this third uh, split in 1870. Now, uh, this conference was formed uh, mostly due to the work of a man named Klaus Lauritz Clausen. He was a Dane uh, who came to this country, but he mostly worked here with Norwegians. Um, there were a lot more Norwegians to work with. That was part of it. Um, he was the first uh, Norwegian Lutheran pastor ordained in this country. It happened at the Old Muskego Church in Muskego, Wisconsin. This building uh, now sits on the campus of Luther Seminary in St. Paul. And if you ever have some time on a nice afternoon, um, go up there and tour it. It's really interesting. Very, it won't take you long because it's really small. Um, but one of the things you note there, um, you have the font and the altar, but then here's the pulpit. Pulpit is way up and over the altar. And that was not by accident. 
that was a, a dogmatic statement that the Lord's Supper is a function of the Word of God. And that's a pushback against particularly the Roman Catholic Church where the sacrament is everything. And the Word is sort of an add-on if you want it. And so because the Word of God proclaimed is so central to uh, Lutheran theology and our understanding of the church, they actually live that out by putting the pulpit above all else. <laughs> Any of you have been down to Fernando, uh, St. Matthew's in Fernando. Uh, their, their pulpit isn't right over the altar, but it's way up in the air. Uh, you get up in that pulpit and you're eye to eye with the people sitting in the balcony. <laughs> um, and it's really a sense of uh, looking out. But it's the same idea. It lifts up the word of God, which comes through preaching and through the sacrament. But those two aren't opposed to one another. The sacrament is a function of the word. Well, in 1867, Klaus Clausen made a very important visit back to Denmark. Uh, because while he was there, he spoke very eloquently uh, and loudly about the need, dire need, for pastors in America. Because uh, we're a good you know, 20, 30 years into the, the big migration, and there's hardly anybody in the United States to serve all these immigrants. Hardly any pastors. Up until then, really only a few lay preachers had come from Denmark. Uh, to work at all among the Danish immigrants there. Well, back in this country then, uh, three years later, he was in Denmark in 1867. 1870, he organized uh, the Norwegian Danish Conference um, and served as, as the first president of that little church body. But there were still no Danish pastors in the, in the Norwegian Danish Conference. Um, they did serve 20 Danish churches, but not a single pastor from Denmark. The conference also founded um, Augsburg Seminary, what is now Augsburg College, right along I-94 in Minneapolis. Um, and there were a number of Danish students from this country who began to study there. So they were starting to provide some homegrown pastors, but still nothing from the church in Denmark. And in fact, it's interesting that the church in Denmark had shown like zero concern for the immigrants. Just like, bye, <laughs> you're not here anymore, so out of sight, out of mind. Um, so almost shocking that there was, there was just very little sense of, what about all those people who crossed the ocean? And, and I think again, this is part of that state church mentality. <laughs> You know, I have my little sinecure here, and I've, I'm getting paid for it, so what else do I need to worry about? In fact, the church in Denmark didn't send a pastor to this country until 1871, which was 25 years after the founding of the first Danish settlement in Heartland, Wisconsin. So 25 years of Danish immigration before a single pastor was sent from the church of Denmark. Even Clausen's visit didn't immediately kick the church into gear. Instead, it sparked an independent effort to uh, provide leaders. It was called the Committee for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Danes in America. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, like all of our corporations in America now are trying to go to one word, you know? We have Nuvera, the telephone company, or, you know, 3M, or... Boy, in the old days, they laid it all out right there in the title. You had the whole message. So the Committee for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Danes in America. Um, it came as a result of Claussen's visit. I don't know if it was technically 67 or 68, but this was a response to his going to Denmark. And it's interesting that the first two pastors that the committee sent, two, first two Danish pastors, had actually been refused ordination in the church in Denmark. Uh, somehow, and I don't really know the story, but they hadn't passed muster. But the committee said, 
but you've got enough gifts, we can send you to the renegades across the pond. <laughs> so uh, they sent him to America, and Clausen promptly ordained one, who turned around and ordained the other. <laughs> Now that's actually more significant than it sounds because uh, the Church of Denmark was very hierarchical and no one but a, but a superintendent, they had kind of ditched the name bishop, but a superintendent would only ordain and only that with all the approval you know, of the whole structure. In America, it's like we don't have time for all that. So Clausen ordains one and he turns around and ordains the other and away we go. I mean, we got work to do. Um, and, and that kind of of sort of grassroots organization, the, the, the lack of concern about hierarchy um, was characteristic of the American church. It drove a lot of European leaders crazy. And eventually it, it actually turned into a kind of conviction. Once the European churches did become more interested and said, well, we could send you some you know, uh, bishops or superintendents who were ordained by the system, it was like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> we don't need that. Um, and it became kind of a conviction that we don't want that level of hierarchy in this country. Well, those two, uh, they were sent by the committee uh, that eventually got ordained, were soon joined by two other Danish pastors who had been missionaries, one in Syria and one in India. And they came from those countries to America instead. And those four pastors got together and formed the Danish Lutheran Church in America in 1872. Um, it was mostly called the Danish Church. Again, they'd put these long names on them and then abbreviate them because it was just too much to say. And apart from one split that we'll talk about here in just a minute, this church basically lasted until 1962. Um, it was the Church of the Happy Danes, so strongly influenced by Grundtvig um, and by his uh, commitment to culture and language and things in addition to um, the Christian faith. The Danish church eventually founded Grandview Seminary, which then later added Grandview College. The seminary went away. That merged into what is now called the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. Uh, but the college remained. Now they call themselves a university. It's interesting that uh, Grandview is probably the most consciously Christian college left in the ELCA. Um, if you know about our ELCA colleges, their commitment to the faith is a bit of a travesty. Um, but uh, Grandview has uh, a couple of teachers. One of them happens to be a seminary classmate of mine, so I'll happily take credit. Um, but they have worked really hard to maintain Grandview as a, a really consciously Christian Lutheran college. Well, much later on, uh, the Danish church, or the Danish Lutheran Church in America, changed its name to the American Evangelical Lutheran Church or the AELC for short, and uh, maintained that name until it merged into the LCA, the Lutheran Church in America, in 1962. And this then is one of the bodies that merged into the ELCA in 1988. So you have first this proliferation of church bodies, and then they boil down, boil down, boil down, um, get bigger and bigger. Not necessarily a good thing, but that's the way it worked. Now, if you get deep into the weeds of all this stuff, as I'm sure you're just dying to do, um, you will find that about uh, 15 years later, there was a split in the Missouri Synod over theology in particular. But the little group that split off there also took the name of the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. That AELC was one of the three uh, bodies that merged into the LCA. So you have this name used by two different bodies, uh, one very shortly after the other. Um, and I know that after a while, the alphabet soup can just make your head swim. You know, it'd be nice if they'd shown a little more creativity in these names, but um, it's sort of the, you find the A's, the L's, the C's, and the E's over and over and over and over again in various combinations. 
Now, the Danish church was first formed uh, by Danes to serve Danes in America. Um, there was a very parochial sense here. We are not here to fool with Germans or Norwegians or Swedes. We are here to serve Danes. Um, and it was still very small numbers, so they served Danes of every background. Uh, they, they couldn't be that particular. Um, that was also true of the, of the Norwegian Danish conference. They would serve all comers at that point. They didn't have the luxury of being too picky or uh, distinctive. However, Intermission leaders, the, mission, the, the leaders of that pietist movement in Denmark, quickly noticed that all of the pastors, or virtually all of the pastors, being sent to America by the Committee for the Propagation of the Gospel were all Grundvigians. They were all pastors who were strongly influenced by Grundvi. And that was a problem because the intermission leaders had serious theological objections to Grundtvig. Remember, he, he downplayed the authority of the Bible as the, the sort of the foundation of the church, put the Apostles' Creed in instead as sort of the living word from Christ that establishes our faith. And the Bible then just becomes a source book uh, for uh, what we believe. Uh, also lifted up baptism, um, sort of over against uh, or in, I shouldn't against, as a priority over the word of God, over the Bible. So the intermission began sending their own pastors to this country. Those who had been trained in their tradition and could bring that theology to America. One of the very first was a man named A.M. Anderson. He just missed 100 years old, uh, lived to be 94. Um, he started a Trinity Seminary in Blair, Nebraska. Uh, if you see here at the bottom, it says Trinitatus Seminarium. So they're using the Latin um, for a really uh, very small school. But that was Old Main. Uh, they later put two wings on either side of it. And that was still there when my wife and I went to Dana. We took all sorts of classes in Old Main. Um, beautiful old uh, uh, French re um, Renaissance uh, structure. It's not Renaissance, it's French something else. Revival. revival. French revival. Um, tragically, Old Main burned in 1988. Um, so it's not there anymore. They put a nice new building in its place, but then the college closed in 2010. So um, that's unfortunate. Later, uh, uh, Trinity... Um, also started an undergraduate school, and that was Dana College, um, which lasted again until 2010, before I went away. Well, as more Danes, along with other Scandinavians, came to America, it resulted in two more church splits. Um, that is, they're focusing more on their own people rather than these conglomerations of all comers. In 1884, the Danes split out of the Norwegian Danish Conference and formed their own Danish church called the Blair Church, named for Blair, Nebraska, where Trinity Seminary was located. Interestingly, though, the meeting actually took place in Argo, Nebraska, in this little church building. Um, again, you can tell it wasn't a big group. <laughs> you can't squeeze too many people in there. And... Uh, this is why on the Dana campus, they had a building called Argo Hall. Uh, it's where uh, uh, my wife lived for the four years she was at, at Dana. It was a women's residence at that time. Um, Argo was just demolished in the last year uh, because the, the campus is no more, and it's a long story. But uh, Argo Hall is gone, but that's why it uh, had that name for a long time. So A.M. Anderson was one of the chief leaders of the Blair Church. Um, and so it's tied to uh, Trinity and to Dana College. But the conflict between intermission Danes and Grunvigian Danes, the happy Danes, also ended up splitting the Danish church. So in um, 1894, 
the intermission group left the Danish church. And they formed the Danish Evangelical Lutheran Church in North America. <laughs> there will be a quiz at the end. Okay? Um, again, it's these same words just over and over again, only put in different uh, connections. Because of the similarity of the names, this one was popularly called the North Church. Because it's the only different word in the title. <laughs> They put North America, so we'll call it the North Church uh, to distinguish it from the others. Um, one of the key leaders of the North Church was a man named P.S. Vig, V-I-G, who later was a longtime professor at Trinity Seminary. Um, and when I was at college, one of the guys living on my floor was a descendant of P.S. Vig. Um, I think a grandson, of, probably a great grandson of, of his. So of this split, 36 pastors stayed with the Danish church, 22 went to the North Church. So it was a pretty, you know, not 50-50, but a pretty devastating split between the two. But of course, it didn't make sense to have two intermission church bodies among this small group of Danish immigrants in the country. So just two years later, the Blair and the North Church united to form United Danish Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Now, what's the one different word there? United. United. And so this was popularly called the United Church. And really from here on, it's just the two. So you have the Danish Church and the United Church. Both 100% Danish. Well, pretty close. Um, but. Uh, that's the, the popular names, the Danish Church and the United Church. Decades later, the Danish was dropped from the name, and it just became the United Evangelical Lutheran Church, or for short, the UELC. And now we're finally getting closer to home, because this was Faith Lutheran's denomination. We were part of the United Evangelical Lutheran Church, the UELC, until the merger into the ALC in 1960, the American Lutheran Church. And the ALC, along with the LCA and the AELC, those were the three partners that formed the ELCA in 1988. In fact, Faith Lutheran hosted several national conventions of the UELC. Uh, one of the later ones, um, somebody brought, actually brought in the kind of the program for it. Um, and they made use of the church and Park Elementary and they had outdoor picnics and basically took over the town, even though it wasn't that huge a group because it's a small church body. But to host a national convention, that isn't too bad. So of these two church bodies, the Danish church and the United church, the United actually grew much more rapidly. Um, as you know, we've said many times, neither one ever got huge. Grand total of under 100,000. Um, and part of that was due to the heavy focus on serving Danes and not having much sense of a mission field beyond that, um, especially early on. But the UELC was less tied to the Church of Denmark. Um, more willing to Americanize and to adapt to uh, the culture and the situation here. So by 1959, this is the, the last year, uh, a full year of statistics before the UELC merged into the ALC. As of 1959, the UELC had about 70,000 members, the Danish church, 24,000. So not quite three times the size in the UELC. Part of that, I think, was because they were more eager to Americanize. I should maybe say more willing, because <laughs> they weren't always eager. Um, and the holdouts for Danish language and, and liturgy was really strong. But they were more willing to Americanize, to use English. Still slow by our standards, English wasn't fully adopted, even in the UELC, until well after World War I. The UELC was also a willing to make use of lay evangelists, not only ordained pastors. And this is perhaps the most famous of them. 
this man called Jens Dixon. He was a, uh, a tiler. He put in, he tiled farm fields in Iowa and made a good living doing that. But he then used virtually all of his money to travel the world as an evangelist. Never ordained, never wanted to be. He was a lay evangelist. And apparently just a remarkable man from the, the testimonies that we read about him. Um, it'd be interesting just to do a whole class on Jens Dixon sometime <laughs> and, and see the kinds of things that he did. The UELC was also somewhat more mission oriented. I don't want to push this too hard because of course the AELC also um, had a sense of mission. Neither church was able to send many foreign missionaries. They were just too small, you know. They're just trying to survive in this country. But as a couple of examples, the UELC had a, a long time presence in Japan. And this guy was at the center of it, J.M.T. Winther. He was a missionary in Japan for more than 60 years. At the time this book uh, that Nyholm uh, wrote uh, was published in 58, he just said Winther was still serving there. <laughs> I don't know for how much longer, because these guys are too obscure even to show up on the internet. Um, and I don't have any other source that talks about him. But for at least 60 years, he was a missionary in Japan. And then one of the key domestic missions of the UELC was the Oaks Indian Mission in Oklahoma. Um, when I was at Dana, they still had ties to Oaks and talked about Oaks Indian Mission all the time, even though that was into the a well into the ALC years. This was actually started by Moravian missionaries. The Moravians are this small German group uh, from Count Zinzendorf uh, formed. But um, in, do I have the year? I'm not sure what year. A, a UELC Dane named Niels Nielsen uh, ended up down in Oklahoma and began working at Oaks with the Moravians. Then he got married and brought his wife down there. And then he started drawing others into the work at Oaks. So in 1902, the UELC took it over entirely. The Moravians were done and it became a UELC mission from that time forward. The Oaks Indian Mission is still going today. And it is supported by Lutheran congregations and individuals. Um, I don't think it gets any formal support from an, any denomination. But it is still going as a mission in Oklahoma, as a school and uh, other kinds of outreach there. So in a way, the, U, uh, the intermission movement, that pietistic emphasis, gave uh, the United Church more spiritual vitality. Again, sometimes it degraded into a kind of petty uh, spirituality. We talked about that last week. Um, whereas the Danish Church did a better job of preserving the language and the culture. They formed the folk schools um, and, and really preserved that. And again, don't draw that too tightly because there was lots of Danish tradition in the United Church, there was mission in the Danish Church, but if you're trying to distinguish the two, that might be how you make that difference. So with faith being part of the UELC, now we know kind of where they belong in the American context, so uh, next week we will uh, start exploring the story of our own congregation, starting back in 1870. You have called to us the life of faith.